A successful entrepreneur and part owner of the 76ers, David Edelman is the man pushing for a new Center City home for the team. And when he's not doing that, he's at one of the social events of the summer, the all-white party in the Hamptons, staged by Fanatic CEO Michael Rubin. It was at that affair that the majority owner of the Boston Celtics, Wick Rousebeck, dared to show up with the NBA championship trophy. And Josh Harris was also there, David Black. And I, I, I physically got sick, okay? Like, I, it literally was like just a kick in the balls. And I saw it, you know, I went over to congratulate Wick, and I was like, I'm not touching that. Getting in touch with David Edelman, next on Fresh 24. David Edelman, my goodness, at 13, you were already investing in off-campus housing. Unreal. At 25, you were the CEO of the Campus Apartments Company, but that's not it. There's more. You helped to establish the Wheels Up Private Aviation Company. You have your own vodka and whiskey company. You're spearheading the 76ers' attempt to build a new center city arena. You're a part owner of the team. Your wife is a terrific movie producer, and you recently, and this is probably your greatest achievement, you recently attended Michael Rubin's annual white party. <laughs> David Edelman, welcome to Fresh 24. Happy to be here. Always great seeing you. Thank you, my friend. All right. So much to talk about. The Sixers' latest moves, of course, the Center City Arena Project, and what it's like being you. But first... <laughs> Michael Rubin's annual white party. Let's get down to business. For the uninitiated, Michael, of course, used to have a piece of the team. He's the CEO of the Fanatics, uh, a wildly successful company, a sports apparel and whatnot, and recently had his annual so-called white party in the Hamptons, and you were there. What's it all about? Look, you know, Michael, as you know, Michael's one of my oldest friends. You know, we met in Philly when we were uh, 24 years old. And, uh, you know, what he has done is nothing short of amazing. Um, his superpower is bringing people together. Um, and that could be, you know, just in a small, close-knit group of people or, you know, with 350 of his closest friends at his annual white party. And his attention to detail for a guy who's focused on so many things at once is really unbelievable choreography of this party is just truly amazing. Um, he is really organized, really detail oriented. You know, a lot of your viewers probably saw his invitations where this George Kondo painting that he sent out had a butler hand deliver them. And then, uh, you know, he collabed with uh, Travis Scott to make a special uh, limited edition um, white on white Travis Scott Nike sneakers, which were just amazing. Everyone, every one of them have the person's name inside and numbered one to 350. Um, the man just doesn't miss a beat. Listen, you mentioned right. Travis Scott. And Travis Scott was just like a relative, I won't say nobody, oh. but he was like an average guy compared to Camila Caballo, Emily Ratajkowski, Tiana Taylor, I'm not finished, Winnie Harlow, <laughs> Megan Fox, Megan the Stallion. Gail King, Kim Kardashian, Khloe Kardashian, Kendall Jenner, Tom Brady, Jay Z, Beyonce, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio, Drake, Quavo, and many, many more. Did you vibe with any of these folks? Yeah, look, a lot of them. You know, you've got like Philly's own Meek Mill, and you know others that are you know were there, and uh, you know he's been doing this for a while. So you know, I've obviously met a lot of people in his circle over the years, and. Uh, you know, Tom Brady, others that, you know, are, are always kind of around and uh, enjoy spending time with him. Uh, parties like this are not necessarily new, of course. Uh, we read all the time, socialites who had mega parties in Manhattan and Hollywood and places like that. Uh, aside from just having a good time, what's the attraction for celebrities to attend these parties, do you think? Um, 
you know, one, I think they know that Michael is, is the way he throws a party is really unique. I mean, you know, Mark, like, you know, did just the staging to, you know, the town on the rooftop to then he converts his tennis court into an indoor club that's draped in velvet lined with tables and a stage um, and, and the exclusivity of it probably because there is a capped number and there will never be more than 350 people that come. And I, I think that's the excitement. And uh, it is kind of a kickoff to summer. I think that's the tradition that's really come from this is uh, why people like doing it. Now, you actually became a part owner of the 76ers, we could say sort of because of Michael. Please elaborate, if you will. Yeah, so, you know, it's actually funny. So when the Sixers were first for sale in 2011, Ruben and I were like, you know, Philly guys, we were like, we should buy the team. We should put guys together. We should do it. And two real things. One, he was focused on building Fanatics. I was focused on a few of my businesses. We were also building a company called FS Investments or Franklin Square at the time in Philly. And um, we were really heads down and respected down our two businesses. And we didn't have the money. So a small deal. <laughs> um, neither of us had the money that we have now, so uh, we we didn't do it. Um, Michael wound up kind of putting in a little bit to become a li you know, limited partner in the team. He bought more over time, um, and then I started doing things with Josh Harris, David Blitzer, Crystal Palace in the Premier League, and some other stuff. And so I developed a great friendship with those guys before we were partners. Um, and then you know, kind of the updated story was. There were moments in time where we thought Michael might sell. You know, there was some time where Michael looked at buying an NFL team, you know, the Carolina Panthers and other things. And, um, it's, you know, it's good he didn't because it really focused him on building Fanatics to kind of this really global brand with, you know, multiple verticals. And, you know, as one of them being sports betting, which really became the linchpin. And so um, Michael was a partner not only in the Sixers, but the whole Harris Blitzer platform, which also included the Devils. So sports betting between hockey and basketball was really he couldn't stay involved and so i really bought him out of the whole you know platform and uh, that's really how it came about aside from having equity is there a role for you to play you know josh and david are really inclusive they are great partners i think they appreciate particularly with the sixers that i'm from philadelphia and you know really entrenched in the community and so they've been really inclusive you know of what's going on decisions that need to be made you know, certainly ask my opinion you know look they've built a great platform i'm honored to kind of you know be involved and you know add my you know my my, my fair share when i can um and uh Really, we have a great team. I mean, you know the people at the Sixers, Laura Price and others that you've known for years. And we have a great CEO in Tad Brown. And uh, Tad's become a very close friend and partner to me. And so, again, being local here, whatever I can do to help the team and help him, it's my pleasure. Yeah, there is one thing that you did I thought was really cool. I think you told me you took Nick Nurse, who is an Iowa native, along with some players to see Caitlin Clark in an NCAA tournament game. Is that right? How did that go? Yeah, so I, I love Nick, and Nick and I have developed a really great friendship. And, uh, you know, literally he lives nearby in Delaware County, so I'm local, so it's easy for him and I to grab dinner and do other things. Um, and we were just kind of, you know, shooting the shit, and he was like, you know, what do you think about, you know, kind of women's basketball? And we were talking about it, and um, I was like, we should go see it. And so, like, literally he's like, you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. And, and Nick being a great guy, Nick's like, all right, I'll arrange a car. It's about a six-hour drive. I'm like, Nick, we're not driving. <laughs> No, 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 no. I was like, look, Nick, I, I will take care of transportation and logistics. You just get us the tickets. And so it worked out to be a... Uh, Air trade. Edelman. How that's else? Right. That's, that's the way to fly. So... I, I, listen, you, you stated that you're, and you're a big Nick Nurse fan. Uh, what do you like about him? By the way, so go to the game for a second. I'm sitting, All right, go ahead. So I'm sitting next to Nick at the game. And it was wild because, you know, it's one thing, obviously, you know where my seats are for the Sixers game and Nick's in front of me and occasionally he'll kind of talk to Josh and I and, you know, we'll, we'll talk to him during the game. But, like, watching him be a fan during a game where someone else is playing, and it didn't matter. You know, this could have been a pickup playground game. Like, Nick's mind, you could see it going. And he starts, like, talking out loud about, like, what to do. I mean, it was amazing. So, like, just to kind of, like – here, the way he broke down the game during the game, you normally don't get that kind of benefit. So that was, to me, like worth the price of admission. All right. We're going to talk about the drive to get the Sixers a new arena built in Center City. It's very involved. I think people are going to find that interesting, both in how you became not only 
what you are, but what it's like to be you at the present time. But first, let's continue with the team. A lot of activity in the offseason. The signings of Paul George, Andre Drummond, Caleb Martin, the re-signing of Kelly Oubre, a new contract for Tyrese Maxey. I'm out of breath. What's next as, as far as you're allowed to talk about? Yeah, so look, I, I, I think first and foremost, what Daryl and Elton Brand have done is really amazing. I mean, if you are a fan of the game and understand that they started free agency with, you know, essentially two signed players, right, and, and built this unbelievable team. And, look, you know, as of this date, we're still not done. We have a couple slots left, and, you know, they're, they're working on a couple things, which I'm not going to go into. But um, I, I just – listen, there's a lot of smart talent in the league. I, I think Daryl is, you know, of the best when you think about how he does it, his intensity for – understanding how the system works he is unemotional in, and i think it's because he's a really great poker player and kind of a statistician he doesn't get the noise doesn't affect him he's like this is the deal we should do and he doesn't deviate during the process or get worn down by the negotiation is that a problem in business in general where you might lose focus and you do get emotional absolutely I mean, speaking from experiences, you know, look, emotion for me in business has been a blessing and a curse, right? Because it moves you to kind of really be passionate about it and not agnostic of an outcome, right? And so I think, you know, for for Daryl, it's, you know, here here's this binary outcome of what I'm willing to give up, what we should receive. And if we can't make that happen, we shouldn't do a bad deal just because the emotions tell you to do it. George just turned 34 aside from really being a great, all-around player. He's got remarkable versatility at both ends and uh, maybe even just a title away from being a Hall of Famer. Uh, what can you tell us from the inside about what it took to get him to come to Philly? I, you know, I, I think what I'll say is that we put together a full court press. You know, there, there's a great video that was put together with lots of Philadelphia natives, Kevin Hart, some of the guys from the Phillies and others to just like show them what the vibe that we have here. I think to his credit, you know, Paul understood what our fan base is like. I think he was excited by the the challenge of our fans, which he knows kind of, you know, holds you accountable. Um, and I think, you know, you look, we we were the beneficiaries of whatever may have gone on with his you know past team and what didn't go on, right? So I think, you know, sometimes, you know, being preparation is the best form of how you create kind of your own luck, right? So I think we were well prepared for how to go after him. Um, we certainly were willing to, you know, give him the value he saw it. And I think our team did a great job. And I, I think what's unique is how we are po po poising ourselves as an organization to show people we appreciate them. You, you'll see, you know, over the last week, you probably saw what's been dropped on Tyrese Maxey, what we did for him um, yeah. to kind of showcase how important he was to the team and to Philadelphia. And this was like a mark of Broadway production that we put together as a team. I don't, you know, I'm sure you've started to see the videos that you know we're putting out now. And um, you know, I will tell you that you know, Rich Paul, Tyrese's agent, was there, and he said, "I've never seen any team do this for any player." That's a pretty big statement, right? That we are doing things that he hasn't seen to show our players that we appreciate them, and hopefully that gets out in the league. You know that you know when, when you think about the Sixers and Josh and David and I and. Daryl and Elton and Nick and what we want to do as an organization to show people they're valued. I think that, that that's going to resonate. Joel Embiid, uh, the team I think has done everything it can to help him stay healthy. He's 30 now. Uh, how's he looking over the summer and what do you anticipate for him this coming season? Uh, you know, A, I'll say, I'll use the word spelt. Like he looked good. So, you know, I, I saw him at the Tyrese thing and, you know, now he's, you know, prepping with a uh, team USA, but like he looked good. He looked fit. He, you know, he, his disposition was terrific. I, I, I know he's excited about the team we're putting around him and he sees the effort that we're making as an, at an organization to give him the tools he needs to win a championship. And that's what we want to do. Uh, forget the NBA champs now, the Boston Celtics. It it, it hurts for even. Yeah, by the way, Mark, you know, you're think about, yeah, go ahead. The thing in the world is Wick showed up to Ruben's white party with the fucking trophy. Oh, you're so you're talking about um, the the owner of the Celtics. Yes, Grouse the owner back, of the Celtics showed back. up to Michael Ruben's white party with the trophy. Okay. Oh boy. And Josh Harris also <laughs> there, David Black, and I, I I physically got sick. 
Okay. <laughs> like I, it literally was like just a kick in the balls and I saw it, you know, I went over to congratulate Wick and I was like, I'm not touching that. Um, you know, and, uh, but you know, I just said to Josh, like, we're going to need to do this. Too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen, your words to God's ears. It's been what, 41 years, something yep. like that. But I, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, aside from the Celtics, I mean, the Knicks, they're a tough out. Uh, you could see it. And, and quite frankly, uh, I, I do like the way they play. They've they they've come up with another Villanova guy now, Mikel Bridges. They're going to be that much more tougher. And don't forget, they had injuries, uh, you know, as the playoffs went on as well. Could this Sixers team now? And I know things aren't finalized, but could they beat the Knicks now in a playoff series? I think when you look at where we are and where I think we're going to end up with a couple of slots, I, I think there isn't on any given day we can beat anybody in the league. I really believe that. All right, David Edelman, we're going to get more into the proposed Center City Arena as well as the South Philly proposal by Comcast Spectacore to kind of spruce things up around the sports complex. Also, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you became you and what it's like to be you. But first, it is halftime. And the first part of our halftime is being brought to you by Garage Beer. It's our Garage Beer six-pack of questions. Garage Beer, beer beer-flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. All right, David, here you go. I will give you a choice between two things, and you just blurt out the answer. No thinking, no analysis, just blurt. Are you ready? I am ready. A cheesesteak or soft pretzel? Cheesesteak. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly Fanatic? Fanatic. Meek Miller Hall & Oates? Meek Mill. Dr. J or Allen Iverson Throwback? Oof. Oh, Dr. come on. Dr. J. That Thank was tough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people find that one tough. Liberty Bell or Rocky Steps? Rocky Steps. The six-pack of questions brought to you by Garage Beer. Beer-flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. I will now give you a handful of artists from my music library, which is vast. And you tell me if you have these artists or not. Are you ready? Ready. The Beatles. Yes. Drake. Yes. Mount Joy. No. Steely Dan. Yes. Lincoln Park. Yes. Who are some of your faves? I'm like a big 80s guy. So I police, police and sting, big Genesis guy, Peter Gabriel. And then, you know, recently Coldplay is probably one of my favorites. Uh, I like Imagine Dragons as well. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of my vibe. All right. Again, we're going to talk about what it's like to be you, how you became you. And your relationship with the Sixers, six man, we're talking about Alan Horowitz. But first, let's get into the Center City Arena, uh, something that I think um, you live with every single day, almost every single hour of the day. Yeah. It's been almost two years now since the team announced that it intended to build something called 76th Place and have it ready by the 2031-32 season. Are you on schedule to make it happen? Yeah, I mean, our timeline has always been that uh, for us to get approvals by the end of this calendar year, uh, and then we would go into deep planning in design, which will take about a year, and then really start demolition in uh, 26. And that gives us ample time to be open by 2031. Why is the team doing this? Why is it a good business decision? But really simple. You know, we're the only team in the state of Pennsylvania that doesn't own their own home. You look at, you know, the Phillies and Eagles used to share a home. And they decided they wanted to control their own destiny, control their own home. Um, 27 of 30 NBA teams play downtown. That's still going to be soon going to be 28 because San Antonio just announced in, in conjunction with the city of San Antonio, a, a multi-billion dollar redevelopment downtown to bring in arena downtown. And so, um, you know, we're going where the puck is headed. Um, you know, we've enjoyed our time at Wells Fargo, but that building doesn't have what our fans today and what basketball fans want. Um, from you know an amenity a sight line and from a premium perspective that the newer arenas have so elaborate on that how will it become more fan friendly yeah i mean there's just a difference so that building was built in 1995 which means it was conceived in it opened 95 96 which means it was conceived in 1990 okay and so you think about that you know being over you know 30 something years ago um the world's changed designs have changed and so the goal is 
a smaller, more intimate bowl is kind of what the future is for these, you know, whether you think of Milwaukee or Intuit or um, Sacramento or any of those buildings. It's just a more intimate feel. Um, our, our current building doesn't have the premium space and the entertainment space that other buildings have. You know, when you look at it, we have one half court lounge, um, you know, for all of the lower level and it's just not enough. Um, and, and, you know, kind of the facilities, I mean, uh, you know, I, I remind people we don't own the building, but we as a team had to put $12 million in to redo the locker room and owner areas. You, you know, Mark, my day job I'm in the apartment business, I wish somebody would pay to do my kitchens and bathrooms for me. Right. <laughs> so, you know, there are lots of things you've heard me talk about, you know, whether it's schedule or amenities or, you know, convenience. How about this stat? 45% of all Ubers to the Wells Fargo Center during a Sixer season start in Center City. Hmm. 45%. That's not David Adelman's hmm. data. That is Uber's data. Okay. Yeah, but that bothers me from the standpoint that why don't they take the subway? And that's going to be a big part of you attracting fans to Center City is public transportation. Well, so look at it this way. That 45% of fans that are starting in Center City, that means they live or work there. They're already there. Okay. And yes, the subway will be a big part. Okay. You know, I live in the main line. And for me to get on, I've done this now like over, you know, 20 times to test it out. You know, hop on the regional rail and I'm there in 22 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me to go to a game during the season midweek, leave my house in Haverford, takes me an hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. 22 minutes is a lot better than an hour. And when you think of the ability to give, we don't have the opportunity to give our fans a pregame experience. Okay. Our fans don't go to Xfinity. We have the data. Our fans don't go to Xfinity Live pregame, and we have no postgame activities for them. We want to, you know, when you see what happens in other downtown venues, people go eat first, they go to the game. Our games are over at nine o'clock. Go get a drink, go do something. That creates energy and vitality to a city. Um, you know, now people in Philadelphia aren't used to that, but like, again, 27 teams around the league do that and have that energy. And that's really what we want to bring back. And as a Philadelphian, for me to help bring Center City back is really important to me. Uh, there's certainly been a visceral reaction on both sides. And a survey conducted last year by the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation. I know you could probably cite the figures by heart, but uh, for the benefit of our audience, 93%, this is according to the survey from the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation, 93% of business owners, 94% of residents, 95% of visitors oppose the arena. Opponents of the arena worry about the development destroying Chinatown and its cultural identity while displacing longtime residents and businesses. I know you've made it uh, a big part of your pitch to try to allay those fears. What have you told those people and have you made any progress? Yeah, so first of all, I think this is a really important fact. There was only 156 people interviewed in that survey. I think it, so people, you know, people, you know, facts matter. Okay. Right. So right. when you have under 200 people surveyed for a survey, you know, the headline numbers of 93%, you know, again, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't do surveys, but that's not that that's not a statistical, you know, relevancy as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, my view is this arena should be good for Center City and good for Chinatown. And what I've said publicly, and I've said it to members in Chinatown, is what would what is Chinatown's future without the arena post-COVID? What industry is left in Chinatown? What What's happening is, and this is fact, more Chinese people live in the Northeast Philadelphia than in Chinatown right now. They've been emigrating to, you know, there's a big section of Northeast Philly where they are. And so I'm just saying, like, let's work together to create some vibrancy, cleanliness, public safety, street cleaning, cameras, those are all things that we've committed to paying for to help bring you know, bring that part of the city back, which is really, it's kind of the uh, desert right now. When you look at Market East, you know, two blocks from City Hall, you've boarded up retail. You know, the gallery malls that, you know, occupy, running at a very low occupancy right now. Earlier this year, Comcast Spectacor, the owners of Wells Fargo Center and the Flyers, launched a plan for a sports and entertainment complex featuring hotels, residences, restaurants, shops, and a small arena for musical performances and whatnot. Uh, this would support the current sports complex, which includes, of course, Citizens Bank Park and Lincoln Financial Field. And reportedly, the Sixers were invited to join, and the team said no. Why? Uh, we said no for a bunch of reasons. You know, one, we want to control our own destiny. Two, I, I, you know, I think, you know, 
people talk that they've reached out to us. They've only reached out in the media, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you know, the truth, no, yeah, so you know, we don't take it seriously. And two, most importantly, when someone is openly, you know, subverting your plans, both publicly and privately, why would you want to be partners with them? I'm just, just being honest. But mm -hmm. that none of that steers away from us moving downtown, controlling our own destiny, having our own home like the other teams have. Um, you know, Comcast is entitled to protect their you know, single arena monopoly in the city, which is what they've been trying to do. Um, this other plan you're talking about, they've been talking about it for 20 years. I hope it happens. We need the jobs. Let's build it. For 20 years, I've been saying they should do something at the sports complex, but we don't need to be there. And I hope it gets done without us. Um, I don't know that hotels and all of those things are getting built in phase one. I hope they do. I don't know what that's going to do for traffic. You know, John Middleton did an interview a couple of weeks ago where he said his number one pain point is traffic. Um, so now you're going to take away surface parking, add structured parking. I don't know what that does for the Eagles, you know, tailgating experience. So like, I have a lot of questions as a Philadelphian, as a developer, forget my own interest as a, you know, you know, someone building a competing project, but you know, Philadelphia needs the jobs. Like if we can, between my project and their project, build a four billion, do four to $5 billion of construction over the next 10 years, let's build it all. David, by my account, you're 52. You're immensely successful, obviously. And the path to success started when you were a boy and a man named Alan Horwitz became big in your life. Alan, of course, is notable to a lot of Sixers fans. He is the team's sixth man, officially or otherwise. And you often see him at games on the floor next to the Sixers bench. Sometimes he's waving a towel. He's very involved in the game. He refers to you as my David, even though you're not actually his son. Um, how did he come into your life? It's a great question. Mark, you know how fond Alan is of you. He, he, he thinks the world of you. Um, Alan was that family friend when you're growing up that you call uncle who's not really your uncle. And it started that relationship. And um, you know, the, the story, you know, you mentioned about the 13 years old, you know, well, it started when I was 11 years old and I'm playing basketball with Uncle Alan. And I said, I bet I can beat you. And he said, oh, I'm going to teach you about betting. And Alan's 80 years old now for those who you know, don't aren't keeping track. And he is still really competitive. And so literally I'm playing basketball and most people let the 11 year old kid win. And instead, Alan, like I lost my basketball, my football and my baseball glove. And I had to go down to his office every Saturday and stack lumber and sweep sawdust to earn it back. Mm. Um, two years later, I'm 13. I had my bar mitzvah. I have two thousand dollars of gift money. My parents are like, "Hey, do you want to give it to your grandfather, who you know was a stockbroker and you know, invest in stocks?" I said, "No, I want to give it to Uncle Alan, and I want I want to do what he does." My parents were like, "What do you want to do?" And he thought it was like the greatest thing in the world. He says, "Well, which building do you want to invest in?" I said, "Can you drive me around and show me what you have? You had all these properties in University City, and I'm like that one." And he's like, why? I said, because it's the biggest one. I'm 13 years old. I knew nothing about real estate. So I hand him a <laughs> bag of cash for $2,000. And, uh, you know, he, I, had, I was fortunate to learn from the Michael Jordan of real estate. You know, this guy taught me everything I knew. He, you know, he backed me to get going and put up money to get me going in business. And, you know, the best partner and mentor you could ever have. And it, we have had a great run, you know, you know, since I'm, you know, in my 20s, you know, with him. So it's been a lot of fun. We're still having fun. Um, and as passionate as you all see him on the basketball court, that's how he is in business. That's mm -hmm. how competitive he is. Um, and, and it's just been great. You know, today, you know, you and I talked earlier about the, uh, uh, Philly youth basketball center, which Alan put up, you know, the $5 million naming gift. And this is going to be his legacy because he's going there two, three days a week now and watching these kids play and have fun. And he, the joy he has watching this is more exciting to him than any business deal he's ever done. Well, by the age of 25, you were named the CEO of his company, Campus Apartments. And obviously, you've done well. Campus Apartments right now is the largest privately held student housing company in the U.S. You also founded an investment firm. You helped to found the private aviation company, Wheels Up. You have many other investments, including a company that owns American Harvest Vodka and Beach Whiskey. What's it like to be you, my friend? Give me a typical day in your life. It's busy. I mean, you know, like it's, uh, I mean, you know, when we try to like go to breakfast or go to or walk it, uh, the phone doesn't stop. I, I love the energy. I have a lot of passion. I love working on lots of things at once, but uh, it's busy, you know, and I'm fortunate that I have really great, you know, people who work for me and people who are my partners in various businesses that help keep the trains on the tracks. 
Um, you know, Campus Apartments, my main business, Dan Bernstein, has been, my, you know, he's my partner and the president of the company. He's been there for 25 years and, you know, just helps, you know, keep the day to day going and really strategic. And, you know, I can name people in all my different businesses. So I think it starts by making sure you're trusting of people. You have people that you can rely on that, you know, will be there for you and that, you know, you can trust. And then also understand your strengths and weaknesses. So for me, my strengths are I'm really good at being kind of a startup kind of a visionary and a connector and structuring person, but I always need somebody on the day to day in these different businesses. Does that to help lasso your ADD? It is. It is because I, I wouldn't be able to finish, you know, finish anything once I started. And, and to help you literally have what a coterie of people, several assistants, a chief of staff. Uh, tell me exactly who you touch base with on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm fortunate. I, and you, you know, you've met Bridget and Kathy, my assistants and Dimitri, my chief of staff. And, uh, you know, we, we just have, we have a host of people that kind of also help support them that, uh, you know, keep the trains running on the tracks. David, you have a beautiful wife, Haley, two lovely daughters. Haley herself is a film producer. She's a book author. How do you balance it all? Your professional lives, parenting, and just being husband and wife? Well, hey, you know, as busy, as engaged as I am, I think, you know, Haley is like, she's she, she has more energy than me and her ability to do her children's books or documentaries and be like a world-class, you know, spouse and parent is really inspiring. You know, I think she was a teacher, you know, starting out and then a college professor. And I, she has this way of just engaging with people to bring out the best with them. And my oldest daughter, Jade, just graduated college and got a job as a middle school art teacher. So like following in her mom's footsteps, um, just really amazing. And so, you know, I think what works for us is, my wife knows that like I'm pretty driven and for me, like I just love the energy. I love working with lots of great people and she's very supportive. Um, but yet she has her own things too that are really important to her. And I think that's important in a relationship is that you can't be just all about one person. You need both of the people to have, you know, things that are important to them. David, we've, we've talked about a lot, uh, a lot about success, about wealth. Uh, in some ways, wealth is stigmatized by many people who, I think ironically, many of them would probably change places and take on that wealth gladly. Um, when you feel stigmatized, what's your reaction? So it's funny because my daughters are very grounded and they don't kind of like the spotlight, the attention that I've unfortunately in some cases put them in. And what I say to them and I'll say to other people is like, look, you know, I've worked really hard for where we are. and you know, I didn't steal it, right? Like I've worked really hard for this. And so like, I'm unapologetic. Like there are certainly, there's a stigma out there. I think it's kind of changed, you know, it's moving away from that a little bit, but like, you know, my wife and I are really charitable, you know, which I think is important so that if you do have some level of success uh, that you do give back and, you know, that's a, we lead with that. I think you and I've talked about that. Um, and so I think if you can show that you're willing to you know, take your success and leverage that in helping other people, you know, that's the best you can do. And the rest is just noise and I don't listen to it. One last question. The 76ers by any measure are a successful business, branding, attendance, winning, a great product. Uh, there are 29 other franchises, part of the business known as the NBA, and they've all, we could say, have achieved some levels of success, certainly more than others. But what's it like to be in a business where despite successes and profits and successful this and that and the other thing you're ultimately judged on one thing and that's winning an nba championship and let me add by the way that both of these teams have been around for more than a half century the phoenix suns and utah jazz neither right. has won a championship in its history and the last time the sixers won was 41 years ago yeah so i tell everyone you know first of all when you talk about success you know the sixers are a top five team in attendance in the whole league Right. And so we know how to put a good product out there. I say that Philadelphia has the best fans in the world. You know, that, that to me is the most important thing. Um, but only a sports team, people will be like, you know, David, what's what's it like? I'm like, it's great when you win. It sucks when you're losing. <laughs> it, it, it does. Right? Like I walk down the street and people will be like, get rid of this one or you should do that. Like everyone's got an opinion. My social media gets like, I, I get a ton of hate. Lately, I'm getting a lot of like, great, we love what you're doing in free agency. Hopefully that, you know, I, I, that, that gets me through the rest of the summer before the hate comes, before the yeah, season right. starts. But um, we have passionate fans and, you know, Josh Harris always says this, you know, the team is really not our team. It's a community asset, right? 
And so making sure that we can put forth the best product for the city and our fans and the region is what's most important. David Edelman, thanks so much for joining us on Fresh 24. Yeah, man. Thanks, Mark. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation, PHL Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience.